Amen. Welcome again to this service of worship here on the second Sunday in the month of October 2021. Let me make a couple notes for you. Repeat what I said earlier before the prelude. Number one, the fall festival will be on the 24th this year, October 24th, here on the main campus from four to six. Parents, children, and entire church family uh, plan to be here. We need volunteers for uh, that service. We also need volunteers for ushering uh, here on Sunday mornings. If you haven't yet volunteered, please do so. We need your help and would love to have you greet or usher at this service uh, on an upcoming Sunday. Also, if you have not been able to turn in your suggestions to the nominating committee, if the Lord leads you, you're a member of the church, please do so and follow up. And if you have any questions, Brian Henry's here, he's uh, chairman of that committee, so plan to be uh, following up on that. Now, this is an exciting month of worship. Not only today, it's great to have you here, but looking ahead to the forthcoming Sundays. And since I see Jim Long and Jack Forbes, I'll go ahead and invite them to be aware that Tim Gordon is going to be here on the 31st for Reformation Sunday, and we would love to have Beatles for that service. All right, now, so a really exciting uh, month of worship and fellowship activities. I want to invite Reed Robertson, who's our Director of University Ministry and Young Adult Ministries, to lead us in our call to worship. This morning from Matthew 10. Jesus said to his apostles, Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you today uh, remembering your great work to redeem your world and your people to yourself. And God, we know that um, you, in order to accomplish that purpose, you're sending us out to proclaim your gospel. You gather us together to uh, build us up and to prepare us for the work that you've called us to. So this morning we ask that you would uh, guard us, strengthen us, give us wisdom, give us clean consciences, and give us peace as we go uh, to accomplish your will. God, would you use this service to accomplish your will? Would you use this hour and this day? Would you use it for your glory? Would you use it for your gospel? So that your word can be proclaimed uh, in Starkville and in all the earth. We thank you for the ways that you've blessed us. We ask that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on us this morning as we worship you. We thank you for uh, gathering us together so we can be built up with the word, and with songs, and with prayer. So that we can serve you. Um, in holiness and righteousness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now do you remain standing for the doxology. <laughs> Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, who f and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all of our sin, who heals all our diseases, who redeems our life from the pit, and who covers us with his steadfast love and mercy. This is the God that we've come to worship today. And as we come to worship him, let us bring our tithes and our offerings to him. Let's pray. Almighty God, you 
our God and God alone. You are the one who heals us from all our diseases. You are the one who forgives us of all our sin. You are the one through whom redemption we have through your son. You are the one who satisfies our soul, the longing of our hearts with acceptance and with forgiveness. You, O oh Lord, are the one that we have come to worship today. Out of all of these blessings that we have received from you, help us, Lord, to worship you today through these tithes and these offerings that we bring to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you want to stand up where you are so I can see you a little bit better, I want to show you a couple things that I've got up here. So I've got this, and in case you are wondering what that is, that is a dead pine branch. That is a dead pine branch. And it, it came off of a tree in our backyard this past week. And it was uh, very clear that as the tree hit, and as the branch kind of came apart, that this is completely dead on the inside. It's very light, it's very dry. You can just kind of pick off the wood. There's really, there's really nothing that is alive in that piece of wood. But then, not three feet away from where this branch fell was this. And this is a branch that was on a bush and as you can tell, I took this off this morning, and there is, it's bright, it's green, and there's berries that are growing. I kind of joked with somebody before coming up here that someone was going to come up to me and say, you know, that's poison ivy, right? <laughs> um, so we're just hoping that it's not. But um, 
And I don't think it is. So I've never seen poison ivy have berries on it. But um, who knows? The, the reason I'm showing you these two things is because this branch, when it was disconnected from the tree, when it was completely broken off, there was, there's nothing flowing through this branch to give it life. There's nothing flowing through this branch to actually allow green leaves to grow. It was completely disconnected from the tree and completely disconnected from the root system in the ground where it gets all of its water, all of its nutrients, everything that's in, in, the, in the ground and allowing it to grow. Whereas this, this was still attached. And when this branch is attached to the vine that it was on and it's in the ground, the water, the nutrients, everything that comes up through those roots is going into this branch and the beautiful result are these berries. You can see, you might not be able to see them from there, but there are some berries on there. And so the point of that is when you and I are connected to Jesus in a relationship, there are certain things in our lives that, that kind of come up because we're connected to Christ. And those things are patience. And Paul calls them fruits of the Spirit. And they, they come only out of a relationship with Christ. And it is patience and kindness and love and gentleness. Those are some of the, just the fruits of being in a relationship with, with Jesus Christ that we have as we walk with him. This branch, like I said, is, is completely dead on the inside. It's completely detached from any life, from anything that is good. And there's, there's no fruit. There's no fruit at all. And so as you go throughout this week, I know some of you are in the middle of fall break. Some of you are kind of beginning school again. I want you to think about how your relationship with Jesus allows you to be more patient, more kind, more loving to your family, to your siblings, into those at school. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for just your word and how we get to understand how the fruits of your Holy Spirit being in our lives affects us from day to day. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for loving us. And we thank you for your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. TLC, uh, five-year-old kindergarten to third grade. We'll meet out there and go down to the fellowship hall.
Amen. May thou rich grace impart strength to my fainting heart. Let us pray together. O oh Lord, we look up to you and we pray, O oh Lord, that by your Holy Spirit, we truly see you and worship you. Lord, you greet us by your grace. You call us as unholy people, sanctified, justified and sanctified in Jesus to approach your throne of mercy with confidence because of his blood shed for us. We come to you in the name of Jesus and we pray, O Lord, giving all praise to you and confessing our sin. Hear our prayers of confession, Lord, and call us to true repentance, to change our priorities today and this week, our routines, our trains of thought, Lord, that we might truly walk with Jesus this week. Hear our confessions. Lord, and our cries of true repentance, asking you to redirect us. And Lord, I know that there are, on our own hearts, others with whom, Lord, and for whom we are concerned, physical and medical matters, spiritual matters, life decision matters. And we lift those folks up in prayer to you now. Hear our prayers, O Lord. O Lord, have mercy upon us and we give thanks that you call us, Lord, in repentance, in repentant faith to true renewal to strength for the journey that comes from you, O God, that we might, Lord, truly be inspired in the zeal that comes by your Holy Spirit to walk boldly and faithfully as your witnesses this week in our families, in our households, in our neighborhoods, at school, at work, and in the world. And in all this, we come before you and pray in the way you teach us, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Beloved, hear the good news. Anyone who is in Jesus Christ is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. In Jesus Christ, let us walk forward into the future that he has for us in the fullness of confident faith. Hallelujah and amen. I invite you to stand with me for our affirmation of faith today, which is the Apostles' Creed. Christian, in life and in death, in whom do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under the Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. And I've been excited about this anthem for a while, listening to the choir practice it, so I'm looking forward to this today. Uh, thanks, Martin. Um, I think one of the things we value a lot about worshiping here at First Pres is the traditional style of worship and the traditional music that typically accompanies it. And from week to week, we hope that the music that we present, um, either through the, the text or the music itself or both, uh, helps you get more out of worship. But today we've stepped out a little bit. This is a little bit different. You're not used to hearing us uh, sing a, a, a rock gospel setting of a very simple song that we all learned as children. 
uh, this little light of mine. Uh, but the goal is still the same. Hopefully this is going to help you enjoy worship more, put a smile on your face as the choir. I've encouraged them to step out on this as well as, as we sing a, a very simple message to this simple song. I hope you enjoy it. Amen. Good. I'm going to let it shine. Let's pray together. Lord, we come before you and we rejoice that you are the light of the world and that you, by your grace and by your Holy Spirit, are in us, bringing us life so that through you, we shine your light in the world. We're not supposed to hide it under a bushel. Oh, no, Lord. And we pray, O oh Lord, that as we hear your word, we might, Lord, rejoice in you, be with you, and be sent in the power of your word and your spirit to be light in a world that so needs you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I hope you have the sermon notes. If you're watching online, we welcome you again. Uh, we'll post these on the website. If they're not already posted, we'll have those for you. And you can reach out to us, too, if you're having problems connecting with those posted notes, sermon notes from today. Today's sermon is God's surprising spiritual warfare. God's surprising spiritual warfare. Gentle justice 
for bruised reeds and Gentiles. Gentle justice for bruised reeds and Gentiles. We are dealing with a century in which we are facing a continual rise of unprecedented levels of opposition to the Christian gospel. Welcome to the 21st century. It's not turning back into the 18th century, I have to tell you, or to the 19th century. You are going to live the rest of your life, most of the rest of your life, in the 21st century. Now, I know some of y'all have more longevity than I do. You may be already looking ahead to the 22nd, but basically, we're primarily going to live our lives, the rest of them, in the 21st century. And this is an age of an, an odd concoction of paganism, Marxism, and atheism. That is, those are... Those are powerful philosophical and fundamental movements and ways of living and thinking that dominate the age in which we live. And all of those, every single one of them, paganism, Marxism, and uh, Marxism is a brand of, a variant of atheism, they all have an agenda of opposing the particularity of the Lord God and his gospel, and his son, Jesus. So if you're going to align yourself with Jesus and say that you find your answers, your salvation in Jesus, you are going to face opposition unless you're hiding under a bushel basket. Okay. Um, so amid these increasing attacks that you're going to see on Christian faith in the public square, on churches, and on Christians, what are we to do? What are we to do? And today we're going to learn again from the scripture that there is a very clear answer. It may not be the answer you're fishing for. It's not the, it's not the, the answer that my human flesh would incline me towards. But, but here is what we are to do. We are to pray, stand, and serve God's raising up of new generations new generations who will stand against the onslaught of opposition to the proclamation that Jesus is the, the singular Lord. How? Well, this is where really the, the trouble begins, but it is the issue we want to deal with today and learn from God's word. This is the how. So I've talked about the what are we supposed to do, the how. We are to be, let me put it bluntly, these are words from Jesus, we are to be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Now, I don't know how smart or skilled you are, but that's a pretty tough combination if you think about it. <laughs> Wise as serpents, yet innocent, blameless as little doves. Well, it turns out this is God's strategy and God's standard, the rule that God sets for us as followers of Jesus, to navigate through everything. Yes, I do mean everything. How are you supposed to parent your children? Be, come on, you know the answer, right? Wise as serpents, but innocent, blameless as doves. How are we supposed to engage in public witness nowadays? How are we supposed to engage in public discourse or division, or anything else that's going on. Well, you know the answer, right? We're supposed to be what? What does Jesus command us to do? To be wise as serpents, innocent as doves. How are we supposed to engage in politics or even respond to the overwhelming just mess and divisiveness and uh, vitriol of the political realm these days in the 21st century? And you know the answer, wise as serpents, innocent as doves in this world, and especially in the face of opposition, even when, yes, especially when confronted by persecution. Jesus says, Jesus commands, be wise as serpents, innocent as doves. Now, you could say, well, pastor, look, that's, that's something that Jesus initially directed to his first apostles back in that stage of ministry 
you know, in, in Israel 2,000 years ago, surely it doesn't apply to us, or surely it's just localized with Jesus and his initial apostles. And I will tell you, no, this theme runs throughout all the scripture. Let me give you one direct link that has to do with how we are to live our lives as New Testament Christians, and that is from the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 16, verse 19. Paul basically echoes the words of Jesus when he, bring God, he brings God's command to us as Christians moving out into the world, and he says, be wise as to good, innocent as to evil. That's Romans chapter 16, verse 19. Be wise as to good, innocent as to evil. How are you supposed to parent? Be wise as to good, innocent as to evil. How are you supposed to deal with your co-workers? Be wise as to good, innocent as to evil. Um, let me go ahead and introduce these words. We'll return to them. Wise. The, the word here means prudent, realistically aware of the situation and what is prudent to do. Uh, this is a positive term. It's not used much in the Greek New Testament. You know, the New Testament is given to us in Greek, right? So, but the, the word here, phronomoi, Okay, is used, let me give you a couple other places where it's used. Back in the Sermon on the Mount, at the close of the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus is talking about different kind of builders, and he says, the foolish builder builds his house on the sand. Do you remember this? But, but the wise builder builds his house on the rock. Same term, exactly the same term is what Jesus then gives later in Matthew, in Matthew 10, 16, be wise as servants. And then on ahead in Matthew's gospel, as, as Matthew reports, Jesus talking about last days and his return, right? And Jesus gives various parables, and one of those is this one. He says, there are 10 bridesmaids in this parable, okay? And, um, Five of them are foolish, and when suddenly the bridegroom arrives, in other words, when the Lord returns, right? Uh, five of them arrive for the wedding party without any oil in their lamps. They're the foolish ones. But five come with their lamps full of oil because they are prepared. They've been preparing themselves for the Lord, for the bridegroom's return. Those five whose oil who have well-oiled lamps, they're referred to as being wise. Again, front of way, same term as what Jesus is saying here. So when Jesus says we are to be wise as servants, that is a positive uh, reality call. We as Christians are supposed to be aware, fully aware of what's going on in the world and be prudent about it. Know how to navigate. But at the same time, Jesus says we are to be innocent. Uh, the word here is akaraoi. Um, it means um, unmixed. In other words, uncompromised, okay? Pure, right? If I were to give you water with just a little bit of poison in it or water that's pure, which one would you take? So, so we're supposed to be totally uncompromised as to evil, okay? We're supposed to be innocent, pure, unmixed, guileless. In other words, we don't use the same tricks that the world uses. Do you hear what I'm saying? So the way that um, a lawyer and a theologian and a philosopher of the Dutch reform tradition back in the early uh, 17th century put it, uh, Hugo Grotius put it this way, we are to be, listen to me, too wise to be deceived. Did you hear that? Too wise to be deceived, yet too good to deceive others, okay? Too wise to be deceived, but too good to deceive others. I think I may have put that in your sermon notes. That's a, a great quote from Grotius. The Grot. Um, so this brings us back to this, it turns out, is God's surprising spiritual warfare for his beloved servant, and for the followers of his beloved servant. This is God's game plan for us. 
<laughs> this is how we're supposed to be living in the 21st century. And it turns out that this is central to who the promised messianic servant is. Now, let me remind you, we're, we're dealing with, uh, we've returned to a section of the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah chapters 40 through 55, that have a whole lot going on. But in the midst of 40 through 55 of Isaiah, there are four just majestic prophecies of a servant who is to come. There are four of them. And today I marked them out for you in the notes. I have a lot more, I have more than usual probably notes in the notes because I'm just trying to give you a framework to understand what we're talking about on these servant prophecies. They're often referred to as servant songs. Uh, the Bible doesn't call them that. That's the invention or the uh, articulation of a 19th century commentator who's very influential, who basically that viewpoint, that, that labeling dominates almost any study Bible, much less commentary you're going to read. But just to, to be clear, these are not per se called songs, but they are prophecies about a special servant. And the, the first one and the last one are biographical from God himself about the servant. And then the, the middle ones are autobiographical from the servant. So as, as you can see, I've got them listed out for you. The first one is in Isaiah chapter 42, verses 1 through 4. That's the song or the prophecy proper. And then it kind of extends, it echoes out through verse 9. We're going to be reading that today. There's also 49, chapter 49, verses 1 through 6. Chapter 50, the third of these, chapter 50, verses 4 through 9. And then the final one, which we spent a lot of time on this spring, uh, you know, around uh, Palm Sunday and Easter, uh, 52, Isaiah 52, verse 13 through 53, all of chapter 53, all through verse 12 there. Now today, Isaiah 42, we're going to read verses 1 through 9. Again, uh, I've got it uh, graphed out for you here so you can understand what you're going to hear as I read it. There's, there's three parts to what we're going to read in verses 1 through 9. Verses 1 through 4, the, uh, the prophecy proper of the Lord God himself acclaiming and commissioning his servant. Okay, but it's an announcement to the world in the context that God has been addressing the entire world and the coastlands and everybody else about who the real God is. That's the context of where we read this scripture. And then verses 5 through 7, the Lord now directly speaks to the servant and commissions the servant. And then verses 8 and 9, kind of a conclusion, back in the context of what is going on in the larger world. So as you can follow along with that, and follow along in your notes, I invite you to hear God's word. And let's turn directly now to God's word and to the three parts of what we're going to read in 42, verses 1 through 9. Isaiah 42, verses 1 through 9. Hear now God's word. Behold, my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be discouraged until he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands wait for his law. That's part one, that's the, the great high prophecy. Now, the address to the servant himself. Thus says God the Lord, who created the heavens and stretches them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it, and the spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord. I have called you, he's speaking to the servant now, in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison those who sit in darkness. And now the third part, verses eight and nine, the general declaration. I am the Lord, I am Yahweh, that is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. Behold, the former things have come to pass, 
and new things I now declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. You know, when you're talking about wartime, and we are in, a, in an age of increasing spiritual warfare, it's interesting to think about wartime surprise strategies and strategies of surprise. Surprise strategies and strategies of surprise. You like surprises? Maybe not when it happens to you. I was a little bit surprised by some of the football outcomes yesterday, were you? It's kind of interesting how it shakes out heading into this week. You know, all kinds of stuff. Well, you know, when we get really serious, like war and really serious, like spiritual warfare, it's interesting to think about strategies of surprise and surprising strategies. A couple weeks ago, you know, I shared with you in last week's sermon about our UK partnership mission and, and some of the work that we did and some of the meetings that we had and, and apply that to the opening of this first of the four servant songs in Isaiah 43, 55. Um, the one who is the delight of God's own soul. I mean, that's about the highest level of scripture you get in the Old Testament. Remember, we talked about that last week. But, but I didn't share with you an interesting occasion that we had in the midst of that UK partnership meeting. Uh, we were heading up to Manchester from London and uh, it turned out that we were going to go have dinner, not in Manchester. We got checked into where we were staying in Manchester, but then our group got on a bus and headed about 20, 25 minutes southwest of the great city of Manchester down into the Cheshire part of uh, England, just to the southwest of Manchester, and to a place called Peaver, and we specifically were going to have dinner at the Bells of Peaver. I don't know if you've ever been to the Bells of Peaver. It is a great uh, pub slash restaurant in the middle of Peaver. I'm, I'd never been to Peaver before. I don't know if you, you've been to Peaver before, but it's a beautiful place. Anyway, the thing about Peaver that was so interesting is the reason Matt Waldock, who is the co-pastor with Ralph, uh, from uh, Manchester City Church, a church that we support in mission, a great generating church for mission and evangelism throughout that, that region of England. Anyway, the reason Matt had arranged this dinner was that he wanted to take us here because he had this general theme about wartime strategy and how important it is in the age in which we live. And this was a restaurant that uh, General George S. Patton, I know this is way before most of y'all's time, but there's a, a general, uh, a, an American general in World War II named Patton, and he and uh, the, the, uh, the Supreme Commander of the Allied Forces in World War II in Europe, a guy named Dwight Eisenhower, and another guy who was Prime Minister of England at the time named Winston Churchill, uh, they would have dinners at this Bells of Peaver restaurant. And so Matt wanted to take us there to have dinner and think about how the Great Commission is even infinitely more important, of course, than what happened in World War II and how we need to plan. The thing that really struck me about the strategy part of this, though, was uh, remembering what was going on with Patton at the time. Patton and the Third Army, uh, they were billeted in Peaver and in the surrounding Nutsford region. And you may remember this in May and June of 1944, Patton became a decoy to distract the Germans. Because what was happening was this, Patton was in the doghouse with Eisenhower because of some of his antics in Italy. And uh, Patton was our greatest battlefield general, hands down. I mean, there's no question about it. And the Germans, of course, deduced that there was no way the Allies would be stupid enough to try to take uh, Western Europe, the continent, the main part of the continent, without having our best battlefield general engaged. Well, what uh, Patton was in the, in the doghouse, and Eisenhower was not going to let him have part in the D-Day landing. And so what Eisenhower did with Patton is he had him up at Peaver. He was staying at Peaver Hall, just down the road from this restaurant we ate at. And the, the, the Americans sent all these inflatable rubber tanks, like a massive amount of tanks, I mean, more than we even had, um, and, and these, these uh, rut-making machines so that at night they'd move these rubber tanks around and make ruts in the road. And the Germans were, of course, surveilling Patton because they knew that obviously we would not attack France or Belgium um, unless 
Patton was at the forefront of the whole attack. And so for May and June, the Germans are distracted by this decoy of Patton at Peaver. Uh, in fact, we'd had all this disinformation going on where they were receiving signals that Patton was planning to attack Calais. And if you know your World War II history, you may remember that even after the onslaught at Normandy, the Germans still, for several weeks, reserved a large portion of their defenses for Calais because they were convinced that Patton was coming to Calais. Never happened. Uh, it turns out that Jesus has surprise strategies, not only for his initial mission, but for you and me too in today's world. And you can read about that in Matthew's gospel, just picking up after the temptation um, of Jesus and his, uh, his initial ministry. Jesus lays out a, just a, a shocking, surprising sermon called the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapters five through seven. Have you ever actually read the Sermon on the Mount? A lot of people say, oh yeah, I love the Sermon on the Mount. Do you really? Do you, do you like forgiving your enemies and praying for them? Do you like turning the other cheek? I don't actually talk to a whole lot of Christians that say, yeah, I get the Sermon on the Mount down. Yeah, I'm just really good at the Sermon on the Mount. Well, that's Jesus's great pronouncement for his strategy for taking the world. The Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew 5 through 7. And then, and then Matthew proceeds to tell us that Jesus begins to implement this surprising strategy. Um, you start reading Matthew chapters 8 through 12 and you're really confronted with this. I mean, Jesus goes around and starts healing, you know, no account people. He's doing this whole Galilean campaign. He's incurring the opposition of the Pharisees. And then... Um, Jesus, in chapter 10 of Matthew, Matthew records that Jesus sends his apostles out. He chooses 12 of them to be his apostles, and he sends them out. And then there's this interesting reversal that happens in what you read in Matthew chapter 10. In verses 5 through 15, Jesus says, I'm sending you out to the lost sheep of Israel. But at verse 16, there's suddenly reversal. And from verse 16 forward, it's the game plan not only for their ongoing ministry, but for how you and I are supposed to live as Christians. How we're supposed to be his witnesses in the world. And the flip is this. Whereas in 5 through 15, he's sending them out to the lost sheep. All of a sudden at verse 16, we are the sheep. And we're defenseless. And we're going to have to rely totally on him. And verse 16 is that verse where he says, Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Okay, so are you going to train us as sheep in mixed martial arts or something, Jesus? Are you going to give us tanks and swords and, and airplanes? No, Jesus says, I'm sending you out as sheep among wolves, and here's your game plan. Here's the strategy. Here's your spiritual warfare. You are to be wise as serpents, innocent as doves. Let's go. And, and then he continues to talk about how they're going to be persecuted and they're going to have to rely on the Holy Spirit to know what to say and they're going to be dragged before all. And it's going to continue all that way until Jesus himself returns. That's the strategy. And then Jesus goes on to show his disciples how to live this out. You get into chapter 11 of Matthew, and Jesus is continuing this strategy. And, and Jesus, at the end of chapter 11, it's, it's an incredible thing. Jesus has mercy on people who are, you know, sinners in no account. And Jesus says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Well, by the way, in the midst of all that, earlier in chapter 11, we've had the protest from John the Baptist, who wants Jesus to bring down fire and brimstone on everybody, right? That's, that's John's approach to spiritual warfare. And John is upset, and he sends 
some of his disciples, John does, to Jesus and says, are you the one or should we look for another? I don't like your strategy, Jesus. And Jesus says, you go back and tell John this. And he starts quoting out of the Isaiah servant songs. And he says, look, the prisoners are set free. The blind see. The lame walk. And blessed is the one who does not oppose my ministry, John. That's the judge talking. Then you get to chapter 12, after all that interesting conversation and Jesus inviting the weak and the lost to come to himself. And you get to 12 and Jesus continues to implement this thing and ramp this issue up to the point where you get to um, Matthew chapter 7 and Jesus boldly goes to the synagogue of Pharisees who he knows are opposing him. I mean, he, he goes directly into enemy territory. And they challenge him. They, they, there's a man with a withered hand. And the issue is, will Jesus again violate the Sabbath? Because we've almost got this guy so we can take him to Jerusalem and string him up. Okay, stone him to death because he's, he's blasphemously violating the Sabbath right and left. And they bring in this guy with the withered hand. And the issue is, will Jesus heal this man in their synagogue on the Sabbath? And Jesus heals the man. And let's turn to this because this is really important that you understand uh, immediately following this, we get the longest Old Testament quotation in all the book of Matthew. And it turns out the explanation is this strategy we've already read from the first servant song. This is the longest quotation of the Old Testament in all the Matthew gospel. Let's just pick this up. Here's what's happening in chapter 12, verse 13. Um, now let me pick it up at verse 11. I'll just read you this because Jesus does this judgment justice statement as the establisher of justice in the earth. He said to them, which of you who has a sheep, if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not take hold of it and lift it out? Of how much more value is a man than a sheep? So it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, the man with the withered hand, stretch out your hand. And the man stretched it out and it was restored healthy like the other. But the Pharisees went out and conspired against him how to destroy him. Verse 15, Jesus, aware of this, withdrew from there. Wait a minute, Jesus, you're confusing me. What are you doing here? And many followed him, and he healed them all. And he ordered them not to make him known. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. Again, now the longest quotation of the Old Testament in all the Gospel of Matthew, and it's the entire servant song proper, Matthew's own translation. Behold my servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved with whom my soul is well pleased. I, have, I will put my spirit upon him, and he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel or cry aloud, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not quench until he brings justice to victory. And in his name, the Gentiles will hope. This is, again, God's surprising spiritual warfare for Jesus and for you, for us, okay? Gentle justice for bruised reeds and Gentiles. So let's see what's happening here. Jesus fulfills God's prophecies of victory through the gospel of servanthood. Remember, we talked about this in introducing this song last week, the gospel of servanthood. God's power and glory is revealed in servanthood. And here, God brings it to bear with Jesus. And notice what the righteous servanthood for Jesus and for us means. When God calls us to follow Jesus, there's several knots. You need to pay attention to this in the servant song. There's a lot of knots here. He will not, and we will not quarrel or cry aloud in the streets. Now, I don't know if you're getting this, but this is totally countercultural to our age. 
If I want attention, and if I want to win, I need to be louder than everybody else. I need to blog more, I need to tweet more, and my ministry needs more followers. I need to get a PR firm to promote my ministry. Oh, no, 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 no. Turn away from those wolves, those lambs, those wolves in lamb's clothing, right? How can Jesus do this? He doesn't cry aloud. I mean, do you hear God just loving Jesus? Behold, my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit on him. He will bring justice to the nations. He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. He's not tweeting right and left. He's not leading a political campaign like most people do in the 21st century. That's not who Jesus is. That's not who God is. And God forbid any Christian who puts his heart and soul into that instead of Jesus. He will not make it known in the street. He's not worried about the street. Why? Because he trusts in God and God has called him in righteousness. I will keep you, God says. Now notice what else he will not do. He will not break a bruised reed. We're not even talking about a tree. A reed, really? He won't break it. Are you hurt? Have you been hurt? Come to Jesus. He does not break. He heals bruised reeds. He will not. A bruised reed, he will not break. A faintly wick. Um, flickering wick, a smoldering wick, he will not quench. You barely got any life in you? Come to him. He'll give you new life. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, Jesus says to you. And notice what else he will not do. He will not give up. He will not grow faint. Okay, he will not grow faint. He will not be discouraged. In the Masoretic text, the Hebrew text, the main Hebrew text, it also says he will not run. He won't run away. Okay? He'll go all the way to the cross for your salvation. He will not run away. He will not despair. Do not despair. You're following him. You're with him. And he will bring and proclaim justice to the nations, to the whole earth so that all will wait on his instruction, his law, and hope in his name. That's who he is. God says to him, I will give you as a covenant for the peoples, a light for the nations. So Christians, Christian parents, Christian grandparents, Christian ministry volunteers, that is our surprising spiritual warfare. We are to follow him and trust in him. God chose and anointed his own son to be the total servant for your salvation and to establish justice, not through worldly might, but by gentle, gracious servanthood. Do you believe him? He saved your soul through that, Christian, if you're saved. Now put yourself into his ministry. Parents, put yourself into believing him. Be wise, wise as to good. Blameless, rejecting anything that's evil. But technology is really complicated now. The world's really complicated. I know, I know. Listen to him. And trust in God's surprising spiritual warfare, which brings the victory. You know, I mentioned that Paul, as he closes out Romans, calls us to be renewed in this strategy about how to live as Christians. It's in Romans chapter 16. I, I read you from verse 19. Let me remind you of verse 20 also, speaking of the victory. Romans, 
19, for your obedience is known to all so that I rejoice over you, but I want you to be wise as to what is good and innocent as to what is evil. Verse 20, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Reed and Madeline are going to sing a response for us now. ways in this world, the way of the servant and the way of the serpent. Most people follow the serpent. Don't you do it. He's going to lose. The God of peace will soon crush him under your feet. I invite you to stand for the benediction. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you then, now and forever. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, as you go. Amen. Mm -hmm.